Hi there again. Uh, well, we got a little cut short due to some time constraints here with my recording ability. But so what I want to do is give you sort of a part two and continue on uh, back up a little bit anyhow in those frames of the last chapter and uh, continue on and get, go over it with a bit more detail for you. Again, we're talking about tornadoes now. Tornado occurrence. U.S. experiences most tornadoes anywhere else in the world. Uh, tornado alleys, with warm, humid surface conditions, cold, dry air aloft. And then uh, some other conditions that are really unique to the Midwest that offer it to be one of the best places in the world or the best place in the world to get tornadoes. Uh, they're, of course, highest in the spring, lowest in winter, though that's not always the case. We've had some winters where we've had some pretty good strong tornado outbreaks, especially across portions of the deep south. Uh, tornado winds, uh, measurement based upon the damage after a storm or by Doppler radar. And uh, for south and southwest approaching storms, winds strongest in the northeast of the storm at about 220 knots uh, at maximum. In other words, getting close to the 300 or getting close up to 300 miles an hour. So very strong winds. And we have what are called multi-vortex tornadoes. Got a picture of one of those to show you. Uh, tornado outbreaks, families, uh, super outbreaks. In other words, we get many tornadoes moving through an area uh, due to conditions that are producing numerous supercell thunderstorms. And generally, these tornado outbreaks all come from supercell thunderstorms. Rarely on occasion we get some with squall lines, but mostly with supercell isolated thunderstorms. Here's where we have the most tornadoes across the United States. You can see right in here through the Midwest, uh, in uh, Oklahoma, especially near Oklahoma City, on average uh, 57 a year. And then as you go northward, they sort of decrease as you get into the plains. South Dakota about 29, and that's 57 for the state of Oklahoma. And then as you go eastward, they sort of trail off, uh, perhaps up in the northeast, maybe 12 here in Pennsylvania, and then maybe one or two in parts of New England, perhaps three a year in Massachusetts. Though last year we had quite a few in the northeast, uh, with about 26 being reported in, in the uh, Pennsylvania area. So quite a bit of tornado activity. Even California gets some, around five a year per average, and they generally tend to be in southern California, though occasionally in around San Francisco there's some tornado damage when conditions are just right. So every state in the Union has reported at least one tornado or several tornadoes a year. <clears throat> Let's look on at the term of the months that are, again that are favorite. Generally April through July are the most active months and then we get somewhat of a resurgence in the winter or the fall months because of when the cold air starts to invade and of course December and January uh, almost none at all into February. Very quiet months. Uh, here's what basically we have going on with a tornado. It's a rotating column of air. Generally moves from southwest to northeast, though not always. Uh, that's not a 100% thing. Uh, winds just outside the vortex may be 150 knots, 100 knots. And then lightest winds on the northwest side, strongest winds on the southeast side, because that's where things are curving around. There's a lot of things going on. That's where the most damage usually occurs with where a tornado is at. Here's the multi-vortex tornadoes. You get a whole circulation, then these sort of mini tornadoes wrapping around it. Uh, these are very damaging systems and usually cause complete destruction in their path. And these whole swath of tornado can be over a mile wide. And then you get the smaller vortadoes wrapping around it and rotating around the whole column uh, counterclockwise. And then this is an example of a large tornado, probably an F4 tornado, maybe a quarter mile wide at the base to a half mile wide and causing a complete swath of destruction as it moves through an area. And then often on the outside, you may even get suction vortices moving up there. If you get a tornado seeking shelter, in other words, where do you go? You go into a basement or a, or a small interior room on a ground floor. But if you've got a, an F4, an F5 tornado coming through, you really need to be underground. You're not going to survive if you're above ground because your house is going to be leveled. Indoor versus outdoor pressure. Uh, in other words, there's a change in pressure uh, that goes on that causes buildings to literally explode at times. The Fujita scale. Based upon the damage created by a storm, F0 is the weakest, F5 is the strongest, and there's the enhanced Fujita scale as shorter goes into more details about that. Average annual number of tornadoes, tornado deaths uh, per year, here we go from 1950 to 59, um, 480, and then we have 148 deaths per year, 1960 to 69, 94, and then 1970 to 79, 100, and then... Uh, 1990 to 1999, about 56 per year. That was 1,220 for that decade. Then 1,277, uh, again 56 on average per year. 
uh, for, for that dot time. And then this is the number of tornadoes per year, actually 1,277, 2,000, 2,009, but the number of deaths uh, per year over that time period uh, decreased. So we know we're doing better with warnings here. Um, as po and then there's uh, something else interesting here. More tornadoes are being reported as populations increase when tornado spotting techni technology improves. So that's why we see an increase here in the number of tornadoes. As far as the Fujita scale goes, we have F0 through F5. And these are weak to violent tornadoes. These are the winds in knots uh, up to 276 knots. That's well over 300 miles an hour. Uh, incredible, incredible destruction, uh, complete devastation of buildings. And uh, sometimes automobiles moved over uh, 100 meters, even further. Still reinforced structures, uh, maybe highly damaged. Uh, brick walls completely leveled and things like that. Very damaging with this type of situation. Uh, in other words, if you have a, an F um, <clears throat> head wind speeds at this high, you would basically level every tree and everything in the area. You don't want to be in that situation. Uh, the modified Fujita scale sort of breaks down the winds a little bit better. And you have an EF5 basically greater than 200 knots. Uh, or miles an hour with a greater than speeds of 174 miles an hour. So this is basically the enhanced modified Fujita scale that we're looking at there. Tornado formation. Basic requirements are an intense thunderstorm, conditional instability in the atmosphere, and strong vertical wind shear. Supercell tornadoes. Wind shear causes spinning vortex tube that is pulled into the thunderstorm by an updraft. Uh, we have what's called a mesocyclone or a bounded weak echo region. This is what we look at on radar. Uh, we see sort of a rear flank downdraft as well, vertical stretching, funnel cloud, rotating wall cloud, and a, a wall cloud itself. Here's what I'm talking about. You have the inflow of air generally coming from the south or southeast, a very strong updraft, uh, winds aloft generally out of the west to southwest, and you have increasing speeds with height. This is wind shear or sometimes change in directions. And this is what causes the rotation. And since rotating updraft, that gets pulled into the thunderstorm and it starts to spin. And as it stretches and gets pulled vertically, it becomes tighter and tighter and must be, uh, and actually gets pulled down towards the ground as it does that. It's just like a spinning ice skater. As they continue to pull their body tighter and tighter, they spin faster and faster. Here's what I'm talking about wind shear. Surface winds say we have winds out of the south. And then up above them, you had winds out of the north. You get these horizontal tubes of air that are literally blowing clockwise. Sorry about that, got interrupted by a little phone call. Back here at it here, we have this horizontal tube of air that I was saying is, that is rolling horizontally, winds on the top of it moving in one direction, and winds out of the bottom of it moving another. And that's basically what this gets pulled into the updraft then, and it starts to spin. And it's that spinning motion that triggers the tornado production. A little closer look at that. Once again, different directions of wind and speed will cause horizontal tubes of air uh, that are rotating. And again, you spin them up and they rotate and that rotation gets tighter and tighter as they grow taller and taller into the thunderstorm. And the result is a tornado. And uh, again, the wind's aloft, the tornado being produced. And here's what we see on radar when we see a supercell. And this is Oklahoma City over here. And here is the radar center, and we're looking out, and we see the main heavy precipitation. And then notice this appendage down here on the side that's got a counterclockwise rotation to it, or hook to it. And this is what we call the classic hook echo. Pay close attention to this. This is on the assignment for this week with radar. And here's what we look at then in a diagram. Basically what we have going on is cold air pushing out, lifting and forcing that air, and the whole thing is rotating and you get an overshooting top around that rotation and that's where the tornado is and as far as fronts go and you get a gust front and this is the downdraft part of the storm as well and then the rear flank downdraft is way back here that's air coming back down so everything's got to equalize the balance of the pressure and this is a very complex moving storm and what we call a supercell tornadic formation non-supercell tornadoes tend to be with gust nados uh, sometimes you get call them a land spout or cold air funnels or another thing. And this is usually common in cold air masses uh, where you get some strange things with shear taking place in the upper part of the atmosphere. 
and they'll produce these cold air funnels that never reach the ground, or very rarely do. Uh, here's what we look at with a gust NATO. Obviously, we're on a, a high-based thunderstorm, but you get a strong gust of winds, and this is, looks like a tornado, uh, but it's more like a gust NATO. Here's a water spout. And you can see it's going up into the storm, but it's over a lake or a large body of water. And again, the rotating updraft, a land spout, you get a strong updraft, and you can get it, there's a little boundary perhaps, and you get rotation around it. And it's the same principles, but they tend to be pretty weak. Observing tornadoes in severe weather, Doppler radar measures the speed of precipitation toward and away from the radar. Two Doppler radars can provide a three dimensional view. We get a tornado vortex signature, Doppler. Uh, Doppler LiDAR also shows this, and we use the NEXRAD radars, which are common with the National Weather Service to do this now, and they're an excellent instrument for finding tornado thunderstorms. Here's a look at wind shear. You can see wind changing direction with height, and this is what we're looking at in Doppler velocities, and perhaps this was that same storm, and you're seeing right here winds blowing away from the radar very rapidly and towards the radar very rapidly over a very short distance, and this would be where we see the tornado. And again, this is looking at that same thunderstorm that was uh, over Oklahoma. And here's a closer look of a Doppler radar chasing truck that's chasing thunderstorms. And they're using Doppler radar to do research on those thunderstorms. Water spouts are a rotating column of air that is connected to a column of co cumuliform cloud over a large body of water. And then there are also, tor also tornadic water spouts as well. Here's a look at that, a little closer look at a water spout over a large lake extending from perhaps a shower or a thunderstorm. That's all we have for you, and have a good time.